This is Fantasy Ask, and welcome back to The Sims 4 Vampire Amazon Royal Saga with the Salazar Coven. Now, I have to say, I did go ahead and record an entire episode that was almost an hour long. It was like five minutes short of being an hour. And we had some important things which happened in the episode. We had a council reappointment, and we had Ice aging up into 18, so she had her birthday. And there was a lot of stuff we talked about. Um, and then, when I threw the footage into the editor, I realized that my mic had no volume. It was, like, mute. So, unfortunately, I kind of lost all of that. Yes, I could have done a voiceover, but I feel like, since I am the type of person that goes off on tangents quite a lot, it is very hard for me to figure out what the hell I was thinking at a certain point in time when my camera was like in a certain place or position. I mean, yes, I could follow along the general thought process, but I, I feel like I would have been quite confused. So I figured, let's just go ahead and uh, record again following what happened, and then I can, you know, just recap everything we did, or I can talk about whatever the heck I talked about. Um, and also, at least this is a good way to get things moving along because, guys, I am like so ready to get this generation over and done with. I want to move on to my Elven Pleasant View, which is a project that I'm currently working on. If you guys have no clue what I'm talking about, then please check out the community board because I have information posted there about what we are going to be doing when Vampire Amazon is off season. Because you guys know it takes me like three, four months to set up for a brand new generation since, you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to build the castle that they'll be going into and then to, you know, give everyone makeovers and just generally get stuff ready, like creating thumbnails. It, it all just takes in intros. It takes time, okay? It takes time and brain power and creativity. Uh, and that can't be done overnight. But 
I do have something in the works for when we are waiting for our vampires. While the vampires are hibernating and slumbering, we are going to be playing with elves. But anyways, that's that's a whole other tangent. We need to dive in to these guys. So let's start off with what we saw in the mini movie. Um, and then we can, you know, get into everything else. But we started off with the queen being maternal and, you know, starting the day off on the right foot by going ahead and wishing Princess Ice um, a happy birthday. At least we got to see that in the mini-movie. Um, but, you know, she's already aged up now, so... Ah, um, that's fine. That is fine and well. But yeah, the queen was saying happy birthday and Ice was, like, so excited because, you know, she's a cheerful child and she just loves everyone and everything all the time. So she was, she was really, really happy that her mother wished her happy birthday, of course. And um, the queen went on to say, I'm so glad that my youngest is now fighting age and, you know, things were kind of lukewarm there. But then she had to add that uh, Ice has the unfortunate fate of having five older sisters. And Ice was kind of confused by this. She was like, what do you mean, royal mother? Isn't it a good thing to have a big family? And the queen said, no, my child. It is terrifying. I don't know why Eden feels the need to, like, thrust insecurity upon her children in one form or another. She's either comparing them and saying that, you know, two of her children are prettier than the rest. Or she's telling them that uh, they are kind of, like, out for their sister's blood or their sisters are going to be out for their blood at some point in time and they, you know they should all be wary of each other fighting each other didn't she tell eve and bloom or at least bloom like she went and told eve that eve has always been really special but then like straight afterwards she told bloom that she should be wary of her sister and never succumb to her so like eden what are you trying to do are you creating conflict between your children you know what guys i feel as though the princesses have always had competition, and healthy competition at that, but they've never been vicious with each other. Yes, they may have split loyalties and priorities, right, um, and allegiances, but they've never been scheming towards each other and vicious towards each other. I feel as though, however, Eden has her own insecurities about her daughters and her own concerns about how her daughters... Um, might be disadvantaged against each other and those insecurities of her own are making her do crap that's like causing even more breakage between her children and even more distance and suspicion between her children like why why do you feel the need to do anything other than empower your kids right in this situation anyways so that was the first scene the second scene was between Diana and Elaine. So these two don't really have any friendships going on with each other, like, at all. But let's not forget, as I do plenty of times, that Elaine is currently our scholar. So Diana had something. She wanted to know some information she wished to acquire, something to learn, perhaps. Um, and it was about Kyra. So she went to Elaine for that, and Elaine was like, heck yeah. What do you want to know? I'll try and help you out. So then Diana asked her, were the Rana Reigns stronger than the visitants? And at first Elaine was unsure where she was going with this, but then Diana said, I want to know how Kyra's bloodline is stronger than mine. And this is not out of jealousy, this is not out of viciousness or insecurity. We know that Diana has this unhealthy obsession, you know, with Kyra. She believes Kyra is perfect and she's always trying to become Kyra. And I think... This was an attempt for Diana to understand in what ways Kyra is superior so that she can lessen the distance between them. Um, because she feels like there's a huge gap between them, and that gap may also stem from, you know, their genetics, their bloodlines, the families they're from. And she wants to know how she can be as good as Kyra. If she has to make up for some weakness in her bloodline, then she is gonna, you know, heck and try and do that. But she needs to know what she's fighting against. So that was that. And then the final scene was between Princess Eve here and Lord Chance, who, you know, we haven't really seen interact much 
Eve was checking in with Chance for the first time, really, since he had that ritual done to him where he was cut off from the bloodline, and she was asking him if he's adjusted to his new sight. This is something we haven't touched on before, but Estelle and Chance, because they had vampiric energy used on them to, you know, do the ritual, their sight is no longer the same, so they see the world in shadows and light, and, um... That's something that obviously is vastly different to what they were born with and what they grew up with. And I think these vampires have kind of access to some of that when they're in their vampiric form. But I don't think it is as severe as Estelle and Chance because they kind of had this ritual forced on them and so much vampiric energy poured into them. So that's kind of like... uh, a side effect and a remnant of that whole process and Chance was saying he's more or less you know adjusted to it but he didn't get the chance to thank Eve for standing up for him at the trial and speaking up for him um, like on his behalf and he said you saved my life your highness I'll I'll remember that so yeah she has rekindled her friendship with Chance he is you know a visitant and she needs to try and, even though he's not part of the bloodline anymore and he doesn't have access to those powers, he still has that um, that background. And even if the world says he's cut off from it, um, you know, he's got the horns and everything, Eve feels as though this is just one other follower that should be on her side. She's kind of like the self-proclaimed leader and messiah, I feel like, of the, the visitant peoples. Um, in the Cellars and Lands. So that's what happened in the mini-movie. Um, now let's go ahead and actually check out Ice's makeover. But actually, before we get to that, we have the council reappointment. And we know previously, um, the council reappointment, we've had Kyra and Guinevere there. And I felt kind of bad for Kyra. Where is she, actually? Let's go find her. Let's go find her. We'll take a look at Ice in a second. Right. I felt bad for Kyra because... I really thought, I mean, we were all excited when she got recommended by Guinevere on the council, and we all thought that she, you know, is finally going to be able to learn things, become a better heiress, she is going to be able to, um, you know, put her own experience into effect to help solve problems in the coven, um, and actually do something for a change, but no, she didn't get to do that. As soon as she joined the council, the only thing that of significance that have happened, that, geez, that has happened in her life is the forced marriage or the arranged marriage that was forced on her by Eden. Like, she became a council member, which is a prestigious role, and then she got told, oh yeah, you, uh, you know, have your marriage arranged to a demon prince, like a hybrid demon prince, and, um, you don't have a choice and you have to go through with that. And then she had a glimpse of happiness there for a bit, um, but according to the last episode, it seems as though there has been some trouble in paradise because she and Mordred share different thoughts about what marriage is. So, Yeah, there is some problems going on here, uh, and we were wondering, or I was wondering, if she's going to have her position renewed along with Guinevere, and news guys, Kyra and Guinevere have been reappointed, both of them, yes, in the Queen's Council. So, last time, you know, the Queen, she had full relationship with Juno, Kyra, and Guinevere, Guinevere, Um, By virtue of being there the season before, she got voted in and then she recommended Kyra to the Queen because she had a closer relationship with Kyra. This time around, it was a clear kind of choice. The Queen had the closest, like a full bar with, uh, not Juno, she had a full bar only with Kyra and Guinevere, so they got reappointed. So hopefully this time around, she gets to learn some things and she actually gets to do some stuff and not just be a pawn in the Queen's plans. Um, I really hope so. I I don't want her to have this opportunity wasted because of other people. So that's what we had for the council reappointment, and now we need to go find Ice, because Ice is a teen, and she's a fabulous teen at that. Okay, we are back. Ice is looking so angelic right now, but we also have a fire on the lot, so that's probably down in the kitchen. We're gonna go and see that in a bit. I'm sure we'll, I'm sure the people, the staff will have it handled, um, but let's, I love this expression on her, she looks so pretty, but I need to, uh, reset so that she has, like, the straight face on, um, but this is Princess Ice, guys, she doesn't have 
like super wavy hair anymore. She's got straight hair. She wears it like that. It's quite long. It's grown out. Um, very much the opposite of Bloom, who is kind of, you know, she's wearing like those ripped sleeves. She's got um, like hair that's all over the place, like a wolf cut, it's shaggy, and looks like it's constantly blowing in the wind, and you know, she's on the run, she doesn't care about appearances. Ice is very different, Ice is very put together. Uh, among the many things she loves about being in the castle is her life as a princess, and you know, the, the, the daily things that being a princess involves, the basic things such as dressing yourself and making sure you're nice and put together. Uh, you know, that you smell nice, you look nice. I feel like that's all ice. She she loves all of these little things. Others, you know, they might be thinking about, like, political power or they might be thinking about just actively doing things. But for ice, she finds joy and happiness in just these basic things. Like seeing her dress all laid out for her in the morning to where I feel like would bring her lots of joy. And... Like, when she sees her sisters, she doesn't necessarily see them as political rivals. She sees them as people that she loves. And, you know, she wants to see, be happy, and know more about. I feel like that's very much Ice. But anyways, guys, I have to say I am very ashamed of the fact that I severely underestimated Ice. I did not realize she would look this pretty. Because she has her mother's eyes. She's got Eden's, like, small eyes and the small pupils. Um, she's got her father's nose and her father's mouth, but like even so, and I think her father's face structure, but even so, I literally thought that um, like she, she wasn't going to be as pretty as um, Bloom and Kyra, but, but I have to now say that this one right here, Ice, she's my favorite princess in terms of appearance. Like, I'm not going to lie. She's my favorite. She doesn't even have the bug eyes that I absolutely love and wanted all the children to have. She doesn't have the bug eyes. Um, and I don't care. I love the way she looks. Like, I, I don't know what it is about her face and just her entirety in general. Um, I love the way she looks, guys. And now that she's a teen, we have all the kids who are teens now. We know their appearances. Let me know who your favorite princess is is in terms of appearance and then you can let me know your favorite princess in terms of character i know for some of you it changes like every episode which i feel like is pretty cool because it, it tells me that we have enough things happen in an episode for you people to change your minds that drastically um but let's let's take a closer look at ice look at her she is just gorgeous she is so beautiful like, I can, I'm not gonna lie, guys, I can see her being queen. Like, personality aside, right? Capability aside, if I had to assign a queen based on appearances uh, of who looks the most queenly, it would be Ice. Just look at this. Just look at this. Like, she and Juno have, like, the same eyes going on at this point. But on her, like, with the combination of everything else, even the freckles, like, oh, she looks gorgeous. She looks flippin' gorgeous, guys. And I was uh, saying, like, in the recording that we lost, uh, I was comparing her to Bloom and saying that, you know, we don't have height in The Sims 4, but if I were to, like, compare the two sisters, I feel like Bloom would have a more petite, delicate, like, smaller build, and, you know, she'd be shorter. Um, whereas with Ice, I could actually see her being the taller sister and I could see her having a broader build and just, you know, just like a stronger, uh, more firm like body and appearance. Um, and then, you know, having like a bit of a cold exterior, I feel like people would assume that she's a bit of a bookworm and she's quiet and she's more introverted and they would assume that... Bloom is, you know, the louder one, and because she looks more playful and more approachable. Um, which, I mean, Bloom is, she is quite, um, I don't know if playful is the right word. She's proactive, but she's not necessarily the most approachable one, right? She's, she's approachable to selective people, right? <laughs> Mainly, like, Eve and uh, Ice. But, and she can be friendly, we've seen her, like, even with Mordred, remember, he was talking to her when they were, when she was a child, and she was friendly to him because, you know, he's, he's a guest 
from a foreign kingdom. So she wasn't rude to him or anything like that. And she's quite grounded, I feel. But she's not actually as friendly and approachable and all that as Ice is. That is kind of more Ice's forte. And in terms of personality, um, Ice here, guys, she got the active trait uh, on top of the cheerful trait that she already has. So I was a little bit worried um, what she was going to age up with because we kind of say that, you know, the trait they get at a certain life stage is the result of the life stage they've just lived through. And so her childhood ears would have had, in, you know, a huge influence on the trait she's going to now get as a teen. And that final conversation she had with Eden where Eden was telling her that it's a terrifying thing to be you know the sixth child when you have five older sisters who are going to be fighting you for power I was worried about the impact that would potentially have on her but seeing her get the active trait made me really happy because I interpret that as Ice not being intimidated by her sisters or concerned about what her mother's saying or you know um, terrified in any way, shape, or form, I feel like Ice is embracing um, her life right now. She's embracing her role, the fact that she also has to start training, the fact that she has to be more active, but she's not like fighting against her sisters, she's fighting alongside her sisters, and that's going to be just another thing that brings her joy and something she loves about being in the coven. She's not going to, um, you know, feel insecure or scared or concerned about the people that she's always loved around her. So I'm really happy. I feel like in that way she's kind of overcome Eve's lack of parenting or she's kind of defeated Eve's insecurities, uh, geez, Eden's insecurities. This is, this is why I shouldn't name people that have like two close together. Eden and Eve. I feel like I'm constantly mixing up Eden and Eve because their names are like so similar. But anyways, that's kind of what we have going on with Ice. Look at it. Doesn't she look? She looks like a flippin' elven queen. She looks queen material, guys. Like, all the other sisters step aside. She looks queen material. If I, And she's not even wearing makeup. She's got no makeup because I don't put makeup on my teens. And she looks so gorgeous already. Like, how? Why? I mean, I shouldn't ask why, but... She looks lovely. She looks flippin' lovely, guys. Huh, okay. But yeah, I think, seriously, Ice right now. I mean, my, my feelings might change once Diana, Bloom, and Ice actually become immortals and young adults. But my feelings right now, uh, in terms of appearance, Ice is definitely my favorite. Okay, well, well, well. We wrapped that up. We talked about her personality. I need to show you her dark form. Um, so we'll go do that. So with Bloom, she's got like white hair and she looks very, she looks like a werewolf in her dark form. Um, whereas with Ice, Ice has black hair. And then she's got the yellow version of her dress. Here we go. So I don't know if you guys feel the same, but to me, like when I saw this, it wasn't exactly what I had in mind, maybe. I, I don't always have, you know, visions of how they're going to end up. I kind of have certain things I like, and then I see where it goes. But she reminds me of, like, a drowned... Or, like, she seems like she would be, like, a drowned bride who came out of the lake, you know, in the wedding dress that she died in. That's kind of the vibe I'm getting. Very ghostly um, and scary. And... I feel like the ghost figures, you know, the girl with the long black hair that you see maybe in a lot of, like, Asian horror movies. That's kind of the vibe I'm getting with her. <laughs> kind of the vibe I'm getting with her. But hey, she's not a ghost. She's not a ghost. She's just a, she's just a vampire. She's just a vampire princess. So yeah, there we go. Um, I feel like her and Bloom make a really cool duo with each other when they're in the dark form. But guys, doesn't she look... I, I feel like she looks the most royal out of all her sisters. She looks the most royal. Like, both in style and also her face. Like, everything put together, I suppose. Um, she looks the most royal out of all her sisters. 
and that's that's kind of why I love her so much. But okay, uh, is the fire ongoing? Is that where is the fire even? Like I don't even know where this fire is at. Where is the fire? I don't know where the fire is at. Not gonna lie, I have no clue. Is it maybe here? We've had fires happen here before. Yeah. Okay, there was a fire here. I think it's kind of going out. I hope it's going out. I can't tell. Okay, that aside. So we've kind of chatted about that. We need to go through our Insta posts. So I am going to do exactly that. Um, I will have a link. So there were three posts that happened after the previous episode. I will have all three of them linked in the description below. And I'll also have a link to the Patreon post. Also, side note, um, thus far I have been doing posts um, that use a certain font and I know some of you use text readers um, and it's like it hasn't been working. I'm assuming this is on Instagram directly because on Patreon I have like screenshots of the posts and I don't know if text reader works from an image, but um, I know some of you have been having problems with that. And at first, I kind of let it be, but then, even with me, like, it's written in English, but every time I look at that font, I don't know why, my brain thinks that it's a foreign language, and I have to, like, concentrate and actually realize it's English to try and read it, which, you know, is probably an indicator that it's a problematic font. So, I have just gone ahead and changed the format a little bit, so that we use the normal flippant font that um, we all use on the interwebs so that it's easier to read and ugh, it's honestly so much better for me now like I'm not I'm not doubting the language it's written in even though it was always in English so that's good hopefully that makes it easier for you guys I don't know if your text readers will work on it hopefully it does though but it might just work from Instagram anyways so the first post we had was checking in with Lady Lucille. Where is Lucille? So Lucille over here, she wanted to go speak to Kyra, which she did. And she was just bringing up the fact that she and Kyra saw something between Catalea and Eve in the outing they had after the wedding reception. And she felt like something strange was going on um, so she was kind of confirming that with Kyra but then Kyra was like oh you mean second mother and Eve well maybe they were bonding over something you know big events like my marriage um, do tend to bring family together so probably isn't really something to worry about so she kind of brushed it off obviously because Kyra doesn't her brain doesn't work that way so she probably doesn't think much of it and um, Lucille was like, oh, okay, consider me mistaken then, like, my, my mind is a bit dramatic sometimes, but if that wasn't the case, then that wasn't the case. I suppose it's nothing to really be worried about. So the two of them, they definitely noticed something, but they collectively have dismissed it. And then the next post was checking in with Lady Guinevere. Now this post, this post made me like sad. It was a sad one. So Guinevere was out at the um, a graveyard and she was actually speaking to the gravestone of Lagatha and she was just telling Lagatha how much she misses her and you know she's watching Kyra and all these princesses grow up into immortals and you know they're completing their training like one after the other and it's making her miss Lagatha and it's making her miss her sons and you know, she kind of wishes she had a family of her own She wishes she had children like blood children of her own and she never expected that Lagatha would die and leave her along with her sons I mean she lost her sons first and she thought at least she had Lagatha But you know even that didn't end up staying the way that it was um, and she's kind of envious of the fact that Lagatha and her sons, even though they're dead, they get to be like on one side with each other. They're, they're all in the afterlife together. Uh, and she's kind of left behind on her own. Yes, there is that romance, you know, she's having with Lucille that's kind of stunning. But even though I would be happy if she did enter into a second romance, Lagatha was just the one 
for Guinevere, I feel. And her sons as well. I feel like... I mean, I love them so much. And I feel like Lagatha, Guinevere, and her sons, they were just the perfect family. And I'm so sad it all got taken away from her. And then she was updating Lagatha on Reed. The fact that, you know, her youngest son Reed has grown up. And um, he would probably make Lagatha proud. And, you know, she'll see him around the castle because he's always visiting. So that was, that was the second post. Seriously, guys, it made me so sad. So, so sad. And then the third and final post was checking in with Lady Delphi. So Delphi was talking to Bloom. So we know that she has always been in the secret council with... Oh, she's a romance of Juno? What? What? When? Okay, we'll, we'll get to this in a bit. We'll get to this. We have stuff to talk about. But um, we know that she's been in the Secret Council with Eve, so obviously she and Eve have been friends. Um, and even though she's in, you know, Kyrie's companions because of her relationship with her brother, they've, they've got like this incest incestuous little, little secret circle going on. But um, she and Eve have been quite close friends, and um, she she also knows that Bloom and Ice, they're kind of, you know, Eve's followers and minions. Um, but they kind of have a higher position than her, obviously, because they're princesses. Um, and she hasn't really been that close to them, but she knows they're close to Eve. Um, and recently, because her and Eve have fallen apart, or, you know, they've grown further apart, she has actually started um, becoming closer to Bloom. And her and Bloom have struck up, like, a bit of a friendship. And so, in the, in the Instagram post, she was actually talking to Bloom, and she was telling, she was confiding in Bloom just a little bit, and saying that, you know, she's been anxious of late, she's got, um, she's got problems that, um, she's being faced with having to overcome, like, the fact that Daryl's flipping drinking from her, but she can't tell anyone these problems, and now Eve's acting strange, and Bloom's like, oh, what do you mean, is she in trouble, does she need help, obviously, that's Bloom. She would, like, dive in front of danger first thing if she thought anything was happening with Eve. And Delphi was like, oh no, I don't, I don't want you to get involved or anything, but Eve, you know, is doing something she probably shouldn't be doing, and I, you know, I hope she gets it sorted out on her own, but maybe, maybe I'll talk to her again about it. Obviously, she hasn't been able to talk to Eve because Eve's been giving her the cold shoulder. Why is Eve giving her the cold shoulder? Well, guys, this is something that I completely missed in the previous episode, but one of you lovelies were very quick to spot it, and you let me know in the comment section. And thank you, because that has informed the story quite a bit. I had some gaps, and now there are no gaps. <laughs> but, um, we essentially had a little incident at, like, the, that venue we were at. Um, so after Catalea and Eve started their secret relationship. They both came down and rejoined everyone else. Um, and Delphi walked up to Eve and she slapped Eve. And they have not spoken to each other since then. And I completely missed that. I feel like a bunch of us completely missed that because we were focused on, obviously, Catalea and Eve's secret relationship. But yes, that happened. And thank you so much to... Um, the viewer who let me know about that because it it has helped inform my story like the third post I had something else already written for the third post but then uh, you know I had something else kind of planned but then um, when you alerted me to the slapping situation and I saw that there was like a timestamp and everything so thank you so much for that once I was alerted to it I had to rewrite the third post because suddenly the story had shifted a bit Anyways, why did Eve slap? Why did Eve slap? Um, Eve slap? What am I saying? Why did Delphi slap Eve? I'm sorry if I'm mixing up the names. You guys know who I'm talking about. Why did Delphi slap Eve is what we want to know. Well, as I was setting up for this episode, or well, the, the previous recording, as I was setting up for the previous recording, um, I noticed that um, Eve had, like, the embarrassed emotion and... She kind of had an embarrassed sort of moodlet going on. Lucille, what are you wearing? No, Lucille, what are you wearing? Get changed, woman. But yeah, Eve had an embarrassed moodlet, and I was like, what? What? Why is she embarrassed? 
So then I checked, and uh, she was embarrassed because she was caught cheating. And then I was like, wait, what? Caught cheating? Yes, she's in a secret relationship with Daryl, but that shouldn't be a problem, right? It would only be a problem if there's someone else that she's involved with. So then I checked her relationship um, panel, and guess what? Delphi's in there. There's a bit of red in the like romance bar. So I was like, wait, what? And then suddenly everything started making sense, guys. I feel like there is something we have all been overlooking when it comes to Delphi. So we all know that Delphi was in a secret relationship with George, right? The red-skinned George, her half-brother. Um, but I feel as though... And, and, and like that's the whole reason she was in the secret circle with Eve because it was a secret circle of incestuous relationships. But I feel like she never had like really strong feelings for George because we haven't really seen them together like we have with Eve and Daryl. Um, so I feel like they both kind of started breaking apart but it was like a mutual thing and now they're just like friends with each other. And there was something in the beginning but it kind of faded out really quickly. Um, but I feel like Delphi never questioned it, and she kind of just stayed with him in front of Eve for appearance sake, because to her, that was something she was already used to, and it, like, made sense. That was the whole reason she was in the circle with Eve. Um, and I feel like more than she was in love with George, she was kind of in love with the idea of what Eve was doing. And because Eve was in a relationship with Daryl, she was emulating that, and she was being in a relationship with George, right? But... In the previous episode, when she saw Eve, uh, like, having something with Catalea, and with everyone else, they don't know Eve has ever been in a relationship, so they haven't seen that side of her. So, obviously, they won't read too much into it, but Delphi knows this side of Eve. She knows the one incestuous side of Eve, and she also knows how she looks when she's being romantic. So, I feel like she was able to pick up the signs of what was happening between Catalea and Eve when other people might have been overlooking it. And as soon as, you know, she did that, she was just overwhelmed with jealousy. And she realized in that moment that she was in love with Eve, and she has been in love with Eve for a long time, but she just didn't know it. Um, and she just could not control her reaction. She kind of felt betrayed that Eve would, you know, pursue anything with anyone other than Daryl, obviously because they're used to the idea of Daryl, but, you know, with another woman especially. So she slapped Eve as a result of that. Obviously Eve doesn't reciprocate her feelings or is even aware of her feelings, and I think Eve has been giving her the cold shoulder because she is kind of pissed off that someone as lowly as Delphi, who is supposed to be a minion and a follower, thinks it's okay to raise her hand on the, the, the rightful princess to the throne, right? So Eve's not happy with Delphi right now. But this is kind of what has been going on. And also, like, her and George, you know, they've, um, they've, they've, like, broken up and they have put an end to that side of their relationship in agreement with each other, right? But that's a different situation to what's going on with Daryl and Eve. So Daryl isn't aware of the fact that Eve now has a secret relationship with Catalea, obviously. If he found out, he'd be very upset by it. So he doesn't know. Also, we know that Eve, she's been kind of growing out of her relationship with... Um, Daryl, she, she finds him kind of boring and lackluster, and I feel like if she found out that Daryl was drinking from Delphi, she would just be, like, sick of him, um, but, and, like, she'd stop stringing him along at all, so there's that, and Daryl's, like, if, I feel like he would be unwilling to break up with Eve, he's, like, obsessed with Eve, he's absolutely and utterly in love with them, so that's kind of something going on there, but she's definitely... She's kind of bored of playing with that toy, I feel like. Um, that That's where Eve is at. And in terms of her relationship with Catalea, guys, I feel like if... I, I know a couple episodes back we said how for Eden, she is aware that she has an unhealthy relationship with Catalea, 
but Catalea is kind of like a drug at this point that she's addicted to. She likes the way Catalea makes it feel, and she doesn't care about it. She is going to, you know, always keep Catalea next to her because it makes her happy, and she doesn't care what other people say. But I truly feel like if she found out Catalea was in a secret relationship with her own daughter, that would be like the end of it. I feel like that would be the last straw. She would not be able to forgive that and to accept that and to have it continue within her coven. Um, I think it would just be sickening and um, it wouldn't end well for Catalea. Like she's managed to hold on so far, but I, I don't feel like that would be, that would be tolerated by the queen. So she's walking on a very, very thin rope, in my opinion. And, uh, Eve, yeah, Eve has, she's, like, jealous right now. She's got drifting love because, obviously, Catalea, she's married to the flipping queen. She's gonna be, she's a stepmother. It's, it's gross. But, you know, she's gonna be openly romantic with, with Eden and such. And, um, they're gonna be quite affectionate, which they are with each other. It is just gross to think about. I mean, Catalea's, like, actively sleeping with Eden, like, all the time. And now Eve's in a relationship with her. It's just gross. But she's seeing all this and, like, she's being envious and she's getting jealous because she has a secret relationship with Catalea. I feel like what Daryl was feeling with Eve, Eve is probably feeling with Catalea right now. Like, they're being sick of, like, you know, walking in the shadows and hiding in the dark. But, but really, we know that she got into a relationship with Catalea. Catalea was the one who actually instigated it and she suggested it. But she got into this relationship with Catalea, I feel like, for political power. So there's not really much emotion behind it. It's probably more like concern that she's gonna lose her influence with Catalea. And maybe it's annoyance that she's having to compete with her mother for this. But she knows the whole reason she's in this is because of that connection with her mother. It is strange. It is a strange complex that these these guys are dealing with. But that's what's going on. Um, so yeah, Delphi, you know, she's secretly in love with, um, with Eve. But now it seems that she's got this romance with Juno. So like what? Is Juno like a rebound relationship? Is this a rebound pursuit? Like what's going on? I don't know. But Juno hasn't really... She kind of flirted with Lexi a little bit, but she hasn't really looked at anyone. So I don't know, guys. Is maybe maybe Delphi and Juno, after being scorned by you know their true loves, um, or losing their true loves, they might end up together. That would be interesting. I feel like if they can kind of stabilize themselves, they might actually be able to enter into a, like a like a pretty genuine relationship without, you know, any power struggles um, or any manipulation. I feel like they might be, they, they, they could have a good outcome. But depending on how they go into this and if this lasts and becomes anything. But let me know if you guys ship these two together. It's definitely interesting. But uh, I also, but like, you know, would Juno go into a relationship with another um, physician? Because her last relationship who you know she was physical with was Azura um and that was when she was in love with Sage and you know that whole thing has left a very sour taste in her mouth but I feel like there's enough time has passed for her to heal so I, I don't know if she would be open to Delphi but that would kind of be interesting they are friends with each other but okay guys with that said and done I am going to leave off here actually before we take off uh, now that, you know, Ice has had a birthday, guys, look, I was right. So we're going to end um, the season at the beginning of spring sometime after Ice becomes an immortal. Because then, you know, all the princesses will be ready to uh, challenge the queen. So there is that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about real quick. So I am just like so ready to get the season over and done with. I really want to dive into my Elven Pleasant view as well. So I am so tempted, like I'm super tempted to just play off camera and check in during the birthdays. But I also don't want to shortchange the younger princesses and I don't want to like 
skimp on developing their characters and personalities because they are the youngest you know they've only recently become teens i feel like the older sisters had so much happen to them and they you know they got so much limelight and story develop um and it feels as though if we just if we leave things as is or if, you know if i skip too much and we dive into the next season i mean yes we could get to know them more then and there but i feel like their characters would be you know a little bit of a blank slate and i definitely want like more texture and flavor so i I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted. I'll see how I feel. Um, I, I will probably start playing more off camera, but I don't want to just skip too much and like just check in the next like three, four episodes for their birthdays because we only have three birthdays left actually. We have Diana turning into immortal, um, Bloom turning into an immortal, and then we have Ice turning into an immortal. So three birthdays, we could like wrap this up in four episodes, but I don't want to sabotage character development. So I'll see how I feel. I'll try and uh, focus on these guys a little bit more, but we're gonna wrap up there guys. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.